Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Belinda Bonmai, and I'll be your MC for today's program. The, our team for today is Disrupt Africa to Build Africa, an Africa Must Think lecture series for AU. Our president, Michael Roxon, will be giving us a brief introduction. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Roxon Nkrumah. I'm the president of Mind Builders Africa. On behalf of Mind Builders Africa, come and then Africa Beyond Aid, I welcome each and everyone to this wonderful lecture series. Halting your busy schedules just to join this wonderful lecture series. We appreciate your time. I will first uh, would like to wish each and every member here a happy African Union Day. Today, we celebrate the union of Africa. There is a wind of change that is blowing in Africa. And trust me, it is going to start right here today after this lecture series. This is the time we can also feel the anger of the African youth and how we want to transform this continent to be a better place for us to live. That is the main reason we came up with this idea and lecture series Africa must think. This is a time of great danger for Africa. Trust me, it is also a wonderful time. It's also one of the greatest time of hope for Africa. Hope in the sense that we have all the favorable drivers to transform this continent to be a better place for us. Today, we are going to challenge ourselves. We need to turn things around in Africa. The assumptions to radically distract Africa and then rebuild Africa. Today, I welcome each and everyone here. Let's stay tuned. We are going to go to a wonderful lecture series by a renowned doctor. And I believe by the, by the close of today, things are going to turn around. I welcome you one night to take up the platform. Thank you so much. Welcome once again. Thank you once again. Our guest speaker for today is Dr. Samuel Kurantin Pippin. Dr. Pippin first trained as an engineer at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Kumasi, Ghana, where he later worked as a research and teaching assistant. He later resigned from his work at the university in order to serve the Central Ghana Conference as its coordinator of campus ministry. He pursued a ministerial training at the Andrews University, Michigan, where he received a master's of divinity degree and a PhD in systematic theology. Thank you so much for joining in. I'll leave the floor for Dr. Pepin to take over. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Africa Must Think lecture series with a theme on this Africa Day as Disrupt Africa to Rebuild Africa. Disrupt Africa to Rebuild Africa. Africa Day is celebrated by the black people all over the world on May 25th. Disrupt Af order to rebuild Africa. Who is an African and what is this Africa we are talking about? The founding president of Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah, described an African by saying, I am not an African because I was born in Africa, but because Africa is born in this event is co-sponsored by Mind Builders Africa. You can check their website and you can find additional information. Mind Builders Africa, Eagles Online, Africa Beyond Age, CAM, and other youth organizations. Let me begin by asking the question, why should we disrupt Africa? What is wrong with Africa? 
It would interest you to know that exactly a week ago today, another youth organization, the Kufo Scholars Program, which is a leadership training program based in Accra, Ghana, founded by the former president. Those in that program hosted a webinar series and the theme upon which they asked me to speak was Africa today, are we cursed? And they asked the question about the black mind. And they said, there's so much beauty on the continent. We have beautiful resources, but something seemed to be wrong with us. There seemed to be a mindset of dependability. And they asked the question whether this is a situation that God willed for us. So the question they ask, are we cursed as black people? What is wrong with our mind? The very fact that this training program, the Kufuos College, raised the question of curse, it means they basically bracketed Africa's problem as a religious issue. That is why they raised the question of a curse. I answered that question by appealing to a sociological reality of Africa, arguing that Africa is a giant. If you just look at the facts of Africa that we must know, you are going to discover we are not cursed. 60% of all the arable land in the world, Africa owns it. 90% of the raw material reserved in the world are in Africa. 40% of the global gold reserve are on the continent of Africa. 33%, one third of the world's diamond reserve are on the continent. 80% of the global reserve of Colton, the mineral from which you know, we produce our telephone electronics are on the continent of Africa, mainly from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And 60% of the global reserve of cobalt from which we manufacture automotive batteries are on the continent of Africa. Africa is rich in oil and natural gases. Namibia, which is in Africa, has the most fish rich coastline in the world. Africa is rich in manganese, iron, and many other natural minerals. As to the size of Africa, it is three times the size of China. It is three times the size of Europe and three times the size of the United States. In other words, you can fit USA, Europe, and China into Africa and still have room for India and many other countries. The space of Africa is 30 and a half million kilometers. China, which is inhabited by 1.4 billion people, has only 9.6 million kilometers squared. Africa is three times the size. And there are 1.3 billion people on the continent. Africa has land that can grow anything. In fact, the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, is capable of feeding all of Africa. And if you take all the arable land on the continent, we can feed the entire world. The DRC has important rivers that can light up the entire continent. Here's the point I'm trying to emphasize. Africa is not cursed. We are a culturally diverse continent. In our music, architecture, sculpture, we are very diverse. Africa accommodates 30,000 herbs and medicines that are being used and modified in laboratories around the world. We can leverage this for our good. And Africa also has a young, global population. It is expected to reach 2.5 billion people in 2050. We are a young population. The average age of Africans today is about 19 years. 
have listed all the natural resources and others on the continent. But Africa's greatest resources are not those in the land, but rather that which is on the land. This is more than a prepositional uh, uh, difference. Africa's greatest resources are not in the land. They are not the gold, the diamond, the oil, the minerals, etc. The greatest resource Africa has is its people, those who are on the land, its human capital. Of these, the nation's most or the continent's most untapped resources are its youth. So Africa is not cursed. It is not. And so the question arises, why then should we disrupt Africa and rebuild Africa? If we are not cursed, what is wrong with us? What is our problem? About eight years ago, I published a book titled Africa Must Think, which has since spawned a series of lecture series, webinars, seminars, conferences. In that book, I attempted to describe the problem of Africa. I started by saying, instead of Africa raising millionaires and billionaires, we have succeeded in producing millionaires. A millionaire in Africa is a person with a lot of nothing, people with nil. Africa, the richest continent in the world, is inhabited by the poorest people on the globe. In Africa, mediocrity is the new standard of excellence. PhD in Africa means pull him down or pull her down. We excel at hammering those who stand out. Whenever an African sees a fellow African rising, then we hammer him, we hammer her. We clip the wings of our soaring eagles so they can become chickens like us. This is the Africa that needs to be disrupted. It is not the Africa that ought to be. The Africa that ought to be, we must rebuild. But in order to rebuild that Africa, we must ask why Africa is what it is today. And by asking why, we can begin to address the issues of what should we do and how should we approach it. This is the problem with Africa. And if you want me to summarize the problem, I'll state it in several of my books by saying the heart of the African problem is the African heart. And this heart or mindset must be changed. So when we are talking about disrupting Africa, we are going to talk about a disruption in the way we think, our mindset. If we are to rebuild Africa, our mindset must be changed. And who should do it? Everyone has a role to play, but today I will lay the burden on our young people. The young people, you constitute the majority of the continent. Almost 65 to 70% of our continent are under 35 years. So if there is to be a change, you are the people to effect a change. So I'm coming to speak to you as African youth, since those of you who have organized this event are youth. You, the youth, are the answer to Africa's problem. You are more in number. You are more energetic in your strength. You have more creative in, in, in your intellect. You are able and versatile with technology. If there is anyone who can disrupt Africa and create a better Africa, it is you, the youth. You still retain the essence of idealism that many of the older folks have lost, and they lost this generations ago. Many older folks are literally giving up on the continent. But you dare not, and you ought not give up on Africa, because you still retain the essence of idealism. Africa needs you. Africa awaits you. 
and the world needs to be hit by the force of what is inside of you, but which is yet to be unleashed. We need transformed African youth to disrupt and to rebuild Africa. Notice the Africa that needs to be rebuilt is not to be rebuilt by any kind of youth, but rather transformed youth, youth whose minds have been changed. Those are the people who can change the continent. And when should this disruption take place? When should we start rebuilding Africa? I'm going to argue that it is now. I will be speaking very candidly to you because you are young, you expect to know the truth. And so we are going to speak pointedly. Now is the time to disrupt Africa and to build Africa. I'm going to lay a burden on you. I'm going to let you realize what is going on and what you can do. The days are over. And so let me summarize where I would be going because throughout the past uh, couple of weeks, I have been hinting at what I will be saying through a series of thought nuggets. So here are some of the things I will be saying in case I lose you along the way, here are the core of what we need to be doing. Number one, we need to start planning and planning ahead. There's a Nigerian proverb, an Igbo proverb, which says a mother bird does not begin building her nest on the day she is in labor. A mother hen would not start creating or building its house the day it is going to give birth or lay eggs. No. In fact, what the Nigerian proverb literally says is what Confucius also said. And he said, a man who does not plan long ahead will find himself in trouble. You'll find trouble at his door. Africa is in trouble. And now is the time to start planning if we are not to be in greater trouble. Because every great thing requires planning. It requires a goal where you are going and it requires concrete strategies how to get there. Even God himself, who knows everything, plans. And so he had a plan for creation. Day one, what he did. Day two, day three. He had a plan for salvation. We call it the plan of salvation. He has a plan for our lives. And if God himself plans, Africa also needs to plan. Life is not an easy journey. Therefore, let us not jump into action without a plan or wait until the last minute. Without planning ahead, we will go nowhere. In fact, without planning ahead, we will have no roadmap to decide where we should go should we find ourselves deciding where to go and how to be there. And if we don't plan, we will end up in the wrong destination. So here is my point. A lack of planning on the part of Africa can be costly. It will be costly. Benjamin Franklin said it. If we fail to plan, we are planning to fail. And so now is the time, Africa, and particularly our young people, now is the time to plan like the mother bird. This is the time to build our nest before labor pains begin. And believe me, the days ahead for Africa are going to be rough. So now is the time to start thinking and strategy and planning. The second point I would leave with you at the close of today, in case I lose you on the way is, now is the time. There is no future time and there is no time to waste. The philosopher Voltaire said, there are four ways we waste time. And African youth, we are wasting a lot of time. Voltaire says, there are four ways we waste time. Number one, when we do nothing. Several of us, the young people of Africa are doing nothing. We are wasting time. We waste time 
by not doing what we ought to be doing. When you know you have to prepare for an exam and you are not preparing for the exam, you are wasting time. You may be doing something, but if you are not doing what is relevant at that particular moment, you are wasting time. Another way we waste time is doing things carelessly. You are actually doing the right thing. You are doing it when you should be doing it. But if you do it carelessly, you are wasting time. Mediocrity is a waste of time. An African youth can ill afford to be mediocre. Doing things carelessly is a waste of time. And doing what we ought to do at the wrong time is a waste of time. And so if we are going to rebuild Africa, number one, we must start planning as young people. Now is the time for you to start networking with other young people on the continent and other people in the diaspora. The third point I am going to mention is if we are going to disrupt Africa and rebuild the continent, we must re reject the notion of African time. I am very pleased that Mind Builders Africa, the host organization that pulled this together, exactly 2 GMT, 2 PM GMT, you started right on time. There is no such thing as African time. We must reject it. It is one of the things that is destroying our continent. And this week, I wrote a thought nugget on African time, and I basically answered by saying, Africa time is a time of fraud. It is not a cultural asset. Our nonchalant, laissez-faire attitude to time is a mindset that must change. When we say we are starting at two, we mean two. If you have to start work at eight o'clock, you must be there at eight o'clock. No excuse. Excusing our luxury of time and rewarding it. Tardiness, procrastination, laziness, indiscipline, and African time, we are being lazy, indiscipline, and frankly, very rude. You cannot rebuild Africa if we are holding on to this notion of African time. We must reject it. Let Africa remember, those who disrespect time are severely punished by life because life is made up of time. And a respect for time is universally mandated in the Ten Commandments. The fourth commandment is a universal declaration of the importance of time. So if we are going to disrupt Africa and rebuild it, not only should we plan ahead, not only should we start now and not waste time, we must also reject the notion of African time. And the fourth point I would make is we must focus on excellence, integrity, and entrepreneurship. These are core principles, core values that would enable Africa to rebuild itself. If I lose you, this is what I'll be emphasizing, and hopefully mind builders in our Africa and your other co-host organizations, we can start having seminar on these cardinal core principles so that we will set ourselves up for what is ahead of us. This seminar today is a call for a change of mindset, a change of mindset. And it is an invitation to you, the young people, to disrupt Africa, rebuild it. Now is the time. On this note, long introduction, I wish each one of you a happy Africa day. And welcome to this lecture series, which is also an Africa Must Think lecture series.
What I'm coming to do in the next few minutes is to argue that we can change the world by being changed. Nowhere, even if you are a Christian, nowhere does the Bible say, go and transform the world. The Bible says, be ye transformed. The change we are calling for must begin with us. That is the point I am going to make. Today is Africa Day. And every Africa Day, there is a theme. And the theme for each year's Africa Day celebration is supposed to galvanize the entire continent and the black people to address some specific issues. This year's theme is silencing the guns, creating conducive conditions for Africa's development and intensifying the fight against COVID-19 pandemic. This is a mouthful of a theme. Basically, it says Africa needs to be at peace. We must avoid all the violence. But in addition, COVID-19 pandemic has created a problem. But this problem by COVID-19 is also an opportunity. Let me explain. Uh, for those of you in Ghana, because of COVID-19, schools were closed down. And as a result, a number of kids got into trouble. In Ghana alone, girls between 10 years and 14 years Last year, in the height of the pandemic, when they were home, almost 2,865 girls between the ages of 10 and 14 got pregnant. Girls between 15 and 19 years, 107,000 plus got pregnant. This is serious. And by the way, these are reported cases which are at least uh, codified or at least recorded in the books. Many went unreported, but 107,000 girls between 15 and 19 school going girls got pregnant. This is a problem. How do we rebuild Africa with this kind of crisis? At the same time, there is this problem. There is also a solution. And I'm glad Mind Builders Africa, you have begun to address this issue. Hopefully you'll give us a little insight into what you are doing for people to know how you are translating this crisis into an opportunity. And then for those of you in Ghana, there is a breakdown by regions. Some regions recorded very high teenage pregnancy last year, led by Ashanti region, almost 18,000 girls got pregnant last year. Eastern region, small region, almost 11,000. Central region, and you go down the aisle. And I'm sure those of you listening from other countries, if we have the statistics, you will discover we have a problem. And any time there is a problem, there is a solution. And whenever there is a solution, you are the answer. Because we can take this problem and turn it into an opportunity of service, and that will result in job creation and things of that kind. So COVID-19 can lead to innovation if we can take advantage. And you better believe it, many organizations, institutions, and nations are capitalizing on this. I need also remind you that Africa Day, May 25, is part of a larger Africa plan. Africa has a 50-year agenda we call Agenda 60, 2063. And as young people, you need to know that your continent has an agenda a 50-year agenda, study it carefully. You can Google, find out Agenda 2063, find out all about it and position yourself to take advantage of it. Unfortunately, several of us have no idea what this is all about. And unfortunately, non-Africans are taking advantage of this, planning against it, and now they are beating us to it. You cannot continue that way. And in this 50-year agenda, every year 
here, there is one theme the entire continent is thinking about. This year, the agenda for this year is the arts, culture, and heritage. The continent is saying we must start using our arts, our culture, our heritage to build Africa, our music, our sculpturing, carving, our cloth making, or everything, our proverbs, our wise sayings. We need to start thinking how we can leverage all of this to build Africa. And it is the transformed youth of the continent who must set the agenda. So I'm coming to say we must disrupt Africa in order to rebuild Africa. And now is the time to do so. Let me now explain to you why it is urgent that we take this issue seriously. We need to disrupt Africa. Why is it urgent? I'll give you a little background. The theme, disrupt Africa, was actually a theme we, we chose last week. I was in Kumasi, the second largest city in Ghana where a group of young people, young professionals, graduates met at what they call I Summit, Innovation, Creativity, and Entrepreneurship Summit. And they were going to discuss how we can identify opportunities in job creation, how we can start thinking differently, job transitioning, assessing funds, etc., etc., and the place of God is in our planning. And I was invited to be one of the keynote speakers and the theme was disrupt Africa. So what I'm about to share with you is part of what I shared with them. There were 102 young people who are dead serious and they came, they learned, it was a whole day event. Now, what I didn't tell them or perhaps I did, is that theme, Disrupt Africa, was a theme we chose three years ago in Zambia. The DNK General Consultancy, it's a young people's group, held a leadership and business summit, and the theme was Disrupt Africa. It was a two-day summit at the Confucius Conference Hall at the University of Zambia, and then the Alliance Francais Center in Lusaka. Here is a summary of what we mean by disrupt Africa. Disrupt Africa is the lens through which we must begin to see our role on the continent. By this, I mean there must be a radical transformation of our mindset. And it should be a mindset towards excellence, integrity, and service. When I say disrupt Africa, it is a call for a revolution, but it is not a revolution where you go around like students, we tend to do break louvers, go on demonstration. No, we need a revolution of the mind, a revolution in our thoughts and action, and we need to start this revolution now. Kwame Nkrumah said, revolutions are brought about by men who think as men of action and act as men of thought. So the revolution we are talking about is a revolution in our thinking. When you go to the dictionary, the meaning of the word disrupt means to interrupt the progress of something that is ongoing. Something is going on and we don't like it and we want to interrupt. Sometimes causes disturbance. It causes disorder and turmoil. Disrupt simply means destroy, usually temporarily, something that is normal. That is what we mean by disrupt. I like the way the Cambridge English Dictionary defines disrupt. It says it is to prevent something, especially a system or a process or event from continuing as usual or as expected. What am I saying? Disrupt Africa means 
Africa has been going on a particular course of action and that is not right. We need to stop it. That's what we mean by disrupt. We must change the traditional way we operate in business. That is what we mean by disruption in business. We must come up with new and effective ways. We must radically change by introducing something new which would arrest the attention of all. So disruption is a form of revolution. We overthrow the old in order to establish something. So we have disruption as social revolutions. We have disruptions in scientific revolutions, etc. But what we are going to talk about is disruption in African mindset. If you don't disrupt it, you would be bought out. In other words, you would lose. Digital photography, there used to be a time when we used digital photography with films, etc., and they did not change when digital photography was coming. And before we were aware, Kodak had lost its ground. It was literally out of the game. Apple computers disrupted desktop. Before Apple came, there were desktop computers. Apple came, introduced something new, and it changed the balance of equation. Smartphones and tablets are changing the way we assess information. It is a disruption. Dell disrupted traditional way of selling computers by going to the internet. And now almost every product is being sold on the internet. Google disrupted advertisement by letting you create your own ad. Wikipedia disrupted encyclopedia. There used to be British encyclopedia, long volumes. Wikipedia said, no, we are going to create our own encyclopedia. Wikipedia disrupted it. Taxi, Uber, K. And through their innovation, they are putting taxis in big trouble. And Uber got satisfied, and now we have Bolt. Even here in Ghana, many people are switching from Uber to Bolt. Bolt has disrupted the way we rent car services. WhatsApp disrupted BBM. YouTube has disrupted DVD. CDs disrupted cassettes. Flash drives disrupted CDs. Phones disrupted post offices. Today, many of our post offices are becoming redundant. Text messaging is disrupting letter writing. Email is disrupting facts. Computers are disrupting typewriters. E-card disrupting physical cards. All I'm trying to say is all around that, there is disruption taking place. Money, mobile money, wallet is disrupting ATM machine and queues at the bank. You don't have to go to the bank. Solar power is disrupting <laughs> electricity corporation of Ghana and generators. Maggi cubes, someone told me, Maggi cubes are disrupting Dawa Dawa. The point is this, the world around us is being disrupted. Every field from education is changing. Now it is not mortar and brick education. You have to go to a big hall classroom with building. Now online education is coming to take over. Computing is changing. Healthcare is changing. Television is changing. Media is changing. Ladies and gentlemen, the world around us is being disrupted. Therefore, African youth, you need to be aware of what is going on so you can also start disrupting the continent in order to rebuild something better. This is a challenge that I am bringing to you. Why should we disrupt Africa? If we don't disrupt Africa, others are doing it. And your continent, your country, your village, your town is being taken over by others who are disrupting the continent. The world is changing. Africa is changing. If we do not think for ourselves, others will do the thinking for us. You better believe it. I've been in Ghana for the past several weeks. 
And it seems to me that our people in Ghana don't fully realize something is happening. Even with the Africa Continental Free Trade Headquarters here in Ghana, people have no idea that with that, the country, the continent is going to be radically changed. If we do not wake up to this reality, we are going to have a shock of our lives. China is on the continent of Africa. And let us not bash China and, and insult them or whatever, because we were not serious. China was planning and literally they are taking over the entire continent of Africa. And then America woke up, oops, we made a mistake. We should have been there earlier. And now America is also coming with a vengeance. They are also coming for Africa. India is coming for Africa. Brazil, Russia, everyone wants a piece of the African pie. So if we, the Africans, we are not serious, we would wake up one of these days to discover we don't have a continent, a land to live or anything. You go to the African Union headquarters in, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, a huge facility. It was built for us and donated to Africa as a gift. You think something is a gift? Think again. Nothing is a gift. There's no thing as a gift or free. The one who gives you the money exacts something from you. So China is taking advantage of Africa. They are not alone. The European Union is taking advantage of Africa. United States is taking advantage of Africa. The Gulf states are taking advantage of Africa. They are all coming to Africa to recolonize us. And unless we are thinking right, we will be in big trouble. Let me give you another reason we cannot continue as business as usual. Traditionally, when we thought about Africa, we thought about the five regions of Africa, North Africa, West Africa, East Africa, Central Africa, and Southern Africa. But ladies and gentlemen, you need to be aware that the African Union officially recognizes a sixth region of Africa, and it is called the diaspora. And the diaspora represents almost 200 million people of African origin who live outside the continent. Anyone whose ancestry can be traced to the continent of Africa, it doesn't matter how long ago they they were taken away from the shores, they are officially Africans. Here is how the African Union defines, you know, the African diaspora. It says, people of African origin who are living outside the continent, irrespective of their citizenship and nationality, but who are willing to contribute to the development of the continent and the building of the African Union are Africans. According to this definition, any person, whether they are Black Americans, Canadian Americans, they are South American Black from Brazil to Cuba to Venezuela to the Caribbean to the Pacific, anyone with Black origin is officially an African. They can come to Ghana, they can come to Nairobi or Kenya, come to Nigeria, take ownership, citizenship, and contribute. The implication is this. These Africans in diaspora, our brothers and sisters are coming back home. Last year in Ghana, two years ago, we call it the year of return. They are coming home with resources. They are coming home with skills. They are coming home with abilities. And if you stay in your country and you are not up in your game, you continue living as if the world around you is not changing, you will stand to lose. I wish I can say this enough. The competition is going to be very fierce. In fact, it has begun being fierce, not only from foreigners, Europeans, Americans, Chinese, Indians, people from the Gulf, Arab states, etc. They are all rushing to grab a piece of the pie, our land, our resources, everything. 
But in addition, our brothers and sisters who have, you know, uh, tuned themselves, who are now coming home, they are coming with education, they are coming with money, they are coming with skills. So if you are, are used to doing things in this mediocre manner, you stand to lose. Because the continent belongs to all of us. We are coming home. And so you better think, if you think you have a university degree, and therefore you can afford to sit home and do whatever you want, you'll be in for a shock. Disrupting Africa means start positioning yourself, otherwise you stand to lose. So now is the time to develop a new kind of youth leaders. Now is the time to be part of a renaissance. I mentioned to you that this Disrupt Africa lecture series, we started it in Zambia about three years ago. At the same time, they, they rallied young people around to disrupt Africa thinking about it. That same year, another group of young people were meeting somewhere in what they call Global Youth Advancement Summit. They brought together 200 young leaders to address and develop innovative solutions to challenges people face. They exchange ideas. They showcase their products and services. They began to build networks and collaborative efforts for the future. My point is this, when Africa, we were sleeping, other young people were starting to develop solutions. Right here on the continent, you need to be aware that there are groups of young people who are networking to find solutions. I can think of one group called the Young African Thinkers, headquarters in Addis Ababa. These were a group of young people, and they meet every year to solve problems. I wrote a book, Africa Must Think, and about that year, I met this group of people. They formed their own organization, Young African Thinkers. And they sit around the table at the African Union, take Africa's problem, and offer solution to them. You see, we often mistake critical spirit with having a critical thinking. That's what Dr. Mengistu said, Dr. Mengistu. Many of us are angry. We are criticizing. Those days of being angry and criticizing are over. Start providing solution. And that is what these new breed of young Africans are doing. Instead of just being angry and mad against politicians, against church leaders, etc., etc., they say we are going to produce solutions. They want to move against ignorance and push for an intellectual revolution on the continent, giving back to critical ideas and solutions. Here is the mission statement we can all embrace. The, the mission is to engage young people in idea generating summits, challenging them to come up with solutions and enable them to implement at different capacities. So yes, it's a vision driven, burdened heart and solution oriented. As uh, former president of Ghana, Ronin said, if you are not part of the solution, you are part of the problem. So ladies and gentlemen, we need a revolution. The revolution is not a young person sitting on radio airwaves or internet somewhere and making noise what people are doing wrong. We need to start finding solutions. And now is the time. The work I do at Eagles Online, we are co-sponsors of this seminar, is we are looking for young people who are willing to be instruments of change. We want to develop eagles in the chicken lands of Africa because there's so much mediocrity, chicken thinking, and we need eagles. Let me tell you why I got into this and what some other young people are doing, which will blow your mind away because you think nothing is happening in Africa. No, something is happening and you must be part of it. About eight years ago, when the African Union was celebrating 50 years. I received a special invitation to come to New York. The uh, special invitation was from the uh, then chair of the African Union Commission. 
to be at the African Union Missions headquarters at the United Nations building. They wanted a representative group of Africans in diaspora to make contribution, to lay a plan for the next 50 years. It is called Agenda 2063. And they brought a host of people from academics, journalists, scientists, all over from the black world, about 40 of them from South America, Caribbean, Africa, who live abroad, come up with a solution. What kind of Africa do we want in the next 50 years? Perhaps the only reason I managed to squeeze myself there is that tiny booklet I wrote, Africa Must Think, that earned me a right to be there. And so when we gathered, it was a three-day conference. The time came for me to make my presentation, and I, I made some friends, those of you from Nigeria listening, one of your sharpest brains, Professor Pius Adesami, brilliant mind, he's a professor or was a professor at Carlton University in Canada. We quickly became friends. We started bonding, strategizing, etc. He said, hey, my, my brother, come to Nigeria and come and disrupt Nigeria. And I said, Pius, you come to Ghana and come and disrupt Ghana. We started planning, by the way, two years ago. We are both at the Addis. And on our way back, I left earlier. And he was involved in a plane crash, the Ethiopian airline. It was a huge loss to the continent of Africa. But while we were there in, at the UN African Union office, we started strategizing because behind the scene, two of us were conversing that, look, here are all folks who have gathered to plan for the next 50 years. And so we decided that when it came to my turn, I should disrupt the meeting. So here is me sitting there and I was making my point. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, we are here to plan for agenda 2063. From 2013 to the next 50 years would end in 2063. We are planning for the young people. In 50 years, all of us will be dead. Where are the youth around the table? I don't think we, we, we seriously considered that issue. Old folks gathered planning for the future of a continent in which all of them will be dead in 50 years and the people who should take ownership were not at the table. That was when I decided that for the remainder of much of my life and work on the continent, I will be promoting youth empowerment to let the youth take ownership. So at every forum I have opportunity to speak, whether to the ministers, ambassadors, heads of state, etc. I make a case for young people. Where are the youth? And we are not just talking about any ordinary youth. We are talking about transformed youth, people who have had a change of their mindset. Lives have been changed, mindsets changed. Where are the youth? This conference you have attended or you are attending is an attempt to bring young people together to challenge us to be part of the solution. And we can disrupt Africa by focusing on excellence, integrity, and entrepreneurship. These are core values which at a later time we need to expand upon how we can do all of these things and take over our continent. We need people who think outside the box, who are willing to solve Africa's problem because the heart of the African problem is our African heart. Our mindset quick must be changed. And whenever the mindset changes, we shall see a new Africa emerging. Let me, for the remainder of my time, show you that there are some Africans who have risen up taking the challenge of Christ, having a new Jesus, and the Bible tells us we must have the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you. And if we have time to explain it, the mind of Christ was a mind of humility, of excellence and service. Not self-service, but public service. If needs be, your leadership you are providing must be willing even to die. That is the value we are promoting. And if you think ordinary young people cannot make a difference, 
Think again. There's an African proverb which says, if you think you are too small to make a difference, you haven't spent a night with a mosquito. Ordinary people can make a difference. So let me share with you what some ordinary young people who are disrupting the continent are doing. Because I'm based here, I will use some young people in this country as example. If I was giving this lecture somewhere in another country, I would tell them what some young people in their countries are doing so that we can be part of the change makers. Because we can make a difference. I have flashed on the screen for you a young girl. And I'm asking, do you know her? She's an ordinary girl. Many of you do not know her. Let me show you her profile. Her name is Nancy Edubonstra, the first black female neurosurgeon resident at John Hopkins University. Since the history of John Hopkins, in the neurosurgeon residency program, there have never been a female black person. This young girl happens to be an African. As a matter of fact, a Ghanaian grew up in Kumasi and here in Accra, and now she's blowing the place. She's making a difference. So the days are over when African women, we think all that we have to do is, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, get married and have babies and not make a difference. Those days are over. I have another young man. You don't know him, but he is disrupting the world in the area of music. This young man, when he sits by the keyboard and he starts playing, he plays as if he is an orchestra. And the world was taking note, and they're quickly getting scholarship to go to America the way America does it. And then once you go there, then they give you a green card, you become a US citizen, and then all your achievements become made in USA. He is a Ghanaian, he's an African, making a difference. I can give you another story of a young man. He had his birthday yesterday. One of the youngest head of department at the University of Energy and Natural Resources here in Ghana, Dr. Mark Amubwatin. He's won so many awards at the age of 33. His team of scientists in Ghana came for the semifinals of a 7 million shell ocean discovery prize a three-year competition for the entire world. This young man, who, by the way, is doing amazing things in the area of technology. I wish we could bring him one day for him to tell you his story. He was struggling. He was an ordinary person like any one of us. But somehow, he had a change of mindset. And now, he's one of the leading scientists in the world. In fact, his innovation, whereby he built a robot that scans the ocean floor to, to search for oil. He didn't have money or resources. He used old laptop batteries, baby diapers, etc. But with sheer force of innovation, he changed the world. Excellence is his way. And even as a student, he started imparting life. I'm skipping a lot of things. What he is doing today, whenever there is a problem, I was giving a lecture at KNUSD, he got so impacted by it, he said, I am going to change. And ladies and gentlemen, he began excelling. And right now, he's a top notch scientist in the world. Young person, I told you, he had his birthday yesterday. Turning all battery into power tubes. You know, Ghana is having this electricity problem, epileptic electricity. He says, I am going to solve that problem. Instead of complaining, doom so or whatever, I am going to use old batteries to light up buildings. And believe me, he is succeeding and he has already got patent to all of this. An ordinary person making a difference. He is not alone. And by the way, he's developing so many things, bioplastics using starch. He's developing the fastest optimization algorithm so that your computers can run very fast. Using your laptop or your cell phone to find diseases, malaria. I mean, this is the young man, an African, a Ghanaian. And you think it cannot happen, it is happening. 
And even little boys and girls are also into this technology business. I, I want to tell you something is happening because I don't want you to live here confused that, you know, we are discouraged, we have the solution, nothing can happen. Things are happening. Google has set up its research headquarters here. Facebook is here. And all the major, you know, the Silicon Valley cities are here in Ghana as they have. Why is it so? A new generation of young people are already disrupting the system. Some of you are aware of the Methodist Girls High School student from Mampi Akwapim here in Ghana, who won the 2019 World RoboFest competition in robotics. There was a huge competition. All the major players of the world from China, India, Japan, all these big knots were there. These Ghanaian group of young girls, they took the first prize in robotic engineering design. They are ordinary people, and yet they are making a difference, telling us that we can do it. In fact, at the same time, at that same event, there was also another group of young boys. This is the junior class. Among the 52 countries represented, this group of junior robotic engineers, as it were, they placed the six position. Here they are, ordinary people from the village, just like every one of us, but they committed to study computer programming, IT, and they are making a difference. These are the people who go to Microsoft and the rest are going after. How did it start? There was this gentleman, Dr. Trebiolenu, who works with NASA. He is part of this he, he top engineers. You know, the space uh, shuttle that went upstairs recently, uh, we have robotic arm on Mars. He is part of that group of engineers. He said, no, I am not just going to stay in America. I am coming to Ghana to start training future Ghanaian robotic engineers. And so he established a school, the Ghana Robotics Academy Foundation, Graph. And believe me, they are producing the next group of engineers. They are disrupting Africa. Here is another gentleman on the screen. Some of you don't know him because he's an ordinary looking person. Do you know him? Well, his name is Kwabna Danso, executive director of Yonso Project. You see the title, you think of a big man. He has won many awards, but what he is well known for is the bamboo bicycle, bicycle made from local bamboo. And he's won many awards, he's organized. You just Google Boomers International, what he uses ordinary bamboos to do. And now he has set up a whole factory in the rural areas. Everyone wants to run to Kumase, Accra for business. No, he comes from a village. He has set up a village factory. They are producing bamboo bamboo bicycles that are being sold around the world. He produced the world's first electric bamboo bike with mid motor made from his organization. They are producing other products from bamboo, including amplifiers, etc., etc. Won many awards. All heads of state are trying to see him. Even the former British uh, foreign secretary, now British prime minister, he had to see him and get his own uh, uh, bamboo bicycle. I was there last week. The US ambassador in the, in the country, Ghana, went to that village because this young man is disrupting the world. Here he is with his wife, another young girl. And they said, we are going to change the system. He has started a school giving scholarships to 400 rural children. I'm talking about a young man. He is not a politician. He is not a pastor taking money from a lot of it. He is just an ordinary young person who is making a difference, sponsoring people to medical school, a library program for the villages, a computer lab for villages. I'm talking, work with UNICEF, produce 150 bikes for young girls so they wouldn't have to walk to school. And when he was doing all of this, he told me, Dr. Pepe, I want to establish a school for young thinkers in Ghana. At that time, he, he, he thought of calling it Great Mind School. So three years ago, he started laying the foundation. He wants to establish a first class school in the village. 
so that the kids in the village will be change makers, critical thinkers. They will take on leadership with integrity. And friends, I wish I could tell you he is succeeding. Two weeks ago, I went to his school and there is he. Now the school has started. It started this past September. There are already 300 school kids from kindergarten whom he is training. If you think you live in Accra, in Lagos, Lusaka, Nairobi, and that villagers will not compete with you, think again. These young kids are being given the best education and they are disrupting it. These are just the school. You go to the school, he even has a mini zoo to teach the children. And you see laptops, computer screen in this rural village. Even voices, I, I wish I could tell, a library where he says, readers today are leaders tomorrow. We are not reading. He says, we better start reading. And he's doing, making a difference. I wish I could tell you other young people, I'm about to wrap up because I'll open it up for questions. Young people are disrupting the continent now. Be part of it. Africa is not case. I told you a week ago, I was talking to the Kufuor scholars. They gave me the topic. Africa today, are we cursed? What is wrong with our black mind? And I said, no. These are a group of young people. You see their faces. This is class of 2023. Every year, at least 2030, are being groomed to be future leaders. If you are sitting in your home, eating rice and not thinking, there are some young people who are being trained. This is class of 2022, getting top-notch training to be leaders. Spoken to them a couple of times, and I'll be speaking to them next week or so. We are not kids. Yali, Young African Leadership Initiative. This is a, a US uh, 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 Foreign Service special program to headquarters in Accra for West Africa, English speaking, the Nairobi for East Africa, Johannesburg in Southern Africa, then the, in Senegal, Dakar for the French speaking countries. These are young people coming together to start looking for solutions to Africa's problem. And every year they network they come to Ghana, you know, from all the uh, nine countries of Africa. They are giving top-notch training to be leaders. They are being trained to make a difference. If you are not training yourself, you'll be left behind. In the cultural arts, they are doing that. I simply want you to know something is happening. They are doing what our pioneers, our founding president did. When in Kroma, Nyerere, Kaunda, et cetera, they were networking. So they knew when they came back to the continent, they had friends. So, hey, come to God, come and study, come and do this. And that is what changed the continent of Africa. And now, Yali is doing something different. Granted, it is funded by the US government, and you can be sure they are funding it, but you know, it will benefit US interests too. Why not? The one who pays the money benefits from it. China is giving more scholarships to Africans than US and European Union combined, but they are going to harvest it. France is giving scholarship. Britain, anyone who gives you the money is not free. You must think, because if you don't think, someone will think for you and use you. My point is, during the past couple of years, over 4,000 have been trained. Then in agriculture, many of us think agriculture has no future. We don't want to farm. Ladies and gentlemen, agriculture is the future of Africa. The land is the future. Kofi Annan's lasting legacy to the continent of Africa is not just the peace and, and, and justice a school, etc. No, 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 no. It is AGRA, AGR, Alliance for Green Revolution for Agriculture. And every year, thought thinkers in a Greek meet the money makers, the scientists, the leaders to see how we can make agriculture and agribusiness great again. Now is the time to start owning land, to start planting some tomatoes, 
and see how we can process it. And so I, I believe in these young people, the last major event where we all met was here in Accra. And the focus was, you know, leveraging the digital uh, technology for agriculture. Kenya is doing very well. All the top brains come there. This is Dr. J.A. Mensah, the one who, who did this uh, anyway. And they come. So if you are here and you are doing nothing, you better wake up. Young people in agriculture are coming there. They are learning. And very soon they will take over your lands and use it for other products. Processing. One of the sponsoring organizations for this event today is CAM. They are also into agriculture, amongst other things. And I wish I can tell you their story, how they are growing mangoes to be processed and exported. Not only that, pineapples. These are young people, maize. They are doing phenomenally well. And they are not just selling the maize, they are also into poultry, producing eggs, etc. Young people. So instead of finishing school and you are writing letter application to bank for employment, wake up and start creating businesses for yourself. I wish I can say more, but I think I'm simply letting you know some people are disrupting the system. They are not politicians. They are not into churches which are duping and fleecing people. They are making a difference and you can do the same. And hopefully during the question and answer time, we'll give them opportunity to answer some of your questions. And then there is a gentleman over here. You, you may not know him, but I hope you come on, on it. He is in charge of the National Entrepreneurship Innovation Program in Ghana, trying to pro help young people do businesses. He started you know, with only $10, $10 in his pocket using his home to start a juicing factory. And ladies and gentlemen, it has now grown to become a big business, e-juice. We'll share them at a later time, because you need to see that it is possible in your country, wherever you are, to change the equation. Anyway, uh, let me conclude on this final one. This year is the year of the arts, culture, and heritage. Many Africans are into music. What are we going to use the music for? Are we leveraging it for national development and creating businesses out of it? There are a lot of stories, proverbs. Who is taking advantage of it? Our languages, who are taking advantage of it? This is the harmonious choral group, one of, you know, arguably the best singing uh, choral group in Ghana. And there are many other good groups, but they have managed to bring back good quality music on the agenda. There used to be a time we were losing it out. We, we abdicated our right to good quality music. And then there was this noise music. They said no. They started good quality classical composition and now it is having an impact that your country, Ghana, has now become the choral music capital of the world because some people were taking music seriously. And with music comes a blend of culture. We can boost tourism. And some of you young people should go into tourism. But we are sitting down there. Last week or so, I was in Kumasi. They were honoring two top Ghanaian musicians, Yao Sapon or Serbwati. And as I sat there and watched them, what struck me was the different artistic expressions of the clothing styles. And I said, where are the young people who are going to make clothes and export this and make a difference? But we don't have eyes to see. And so ladies and gentlemen, we can make a difference. We can disrupt Africa. Young people, we can make a difference. Even if you are the only person, you can make a difference. Let me end with this poem. In case you are there and you think, oh, but I'm poor, I'm just ordinary person, I cannot make a difference. Think again. One person can make a difference. Sir James Allen 
1926, wrote a poem about one solitary life. Let me read it to you. He says, he was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure village where he worked in a carpenter's shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never owned a home. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family. He never went to college. He never visited a big city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place where he was born. He never did one of the things that accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 when the tide of public opinion turned against him. One of his friends betrayed him. Others deserted him. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed upon a cross between two thieves. And while dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property he had on earth. And when he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. But three days later, he rose from the dead. Those are the facts of his human life. 20 centuries have come and gone. And today, he is the centerpiece of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that have ever sailed, all the parliaments that have ever sat, all the kings that have ever reigned put together have not affected the life of mankind on this planet as powerfully as that one solitary life. Just one person, Jesus Christ, he made a difference. You, enabled by him, you can also make a difference. Whether you made it to school or not, whether you have a degree or not, whether you come from a bad background or not, whether you have parents or not, whatever, regardless of your circumstances, enabled by Christ, you can be the answer to Africa's dilemma and the world would listen. You are the answer. And now is the time to disrupt Africa. May the Lord bless us and help us to be change agents. Thank you very much. And I now hand over to Belinda and you would moderate the Q&A session. Disrupt Africa is the theme. Make a difference, a change. Now is the time. Belinda, it is your turn. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Pippen, for this. I know I've learned a lot and I hope everyone that joined has also learned a lot. We now have our Q&A section and I would entreat you that if you have a question, you can either type it out so we read it for Dr. Pippin or you raise your hand so that we allow you to actually talk to him yourself. Thank you very much. So we have the next five minutes to do our Q&A section. There is already a question on the platform. Go ahead. If you can read the question to us. Please, you can go ahead and ask your question. Or if you want it to be read, we can equally do that for you. Mwanda is asking, do we, how do we navigate our broken political systems seeing that they play a major role in this journey. I believe that policies must create an environment that will promote growth for the African youth. This is from Mwanda, an MSc student. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
how, how do we navigate the current political system, which in many cases are, are broken? In almost all the countries of Africa, the political system have broken. How do we navigate it? My answer is excellence is a strategic asset. If you excel, politicians have no option than to take you seriously. I gave you the example of Kwabna Danso, just an ordinary person deciding to go to the rural areas in his village to start doing something. Because he excelled, the politicians were forced to come down to his village, including even the prime minister of UK, the Netherlands, etc. And I told you last week, the, 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 the US, they always, excellence is a strategic asset. You don't have to be a politician to make a difference. I, 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 I'm in the country, Ghana here, and I'm sure it is happening all over. Young people think the only way they can make it ahead is by being politicians. If God has called you to be a politician in the right you know, way, go ahead. But the call we are talking about, the change of mindset begins with you. No politician can prevent you from farming. No politician can prevent you from composing your music or doing art. So that is where it must begin. Number two, as we excel, then the government will recognize it. We start as a leveraging, building alliances, and then we force a change in policies. I can tell you, one of the uh, uh, sponsors of this organization that I, I wanted him to come on board because he needs to tell us what the government is doing for young people. He is a young person who has risen through the ranks. He did so well in his private life, non-politician that the government recognized him. And I said, come and tell us how you are using your influence now to help shape policies. You cannot begin to shape policies unless you are excelling. Number two or number three, unless you embrace integrity. Many of us think we can cut corners in order to go ahead. No, there are people who are doing and playing by the book. They are doing honest job, no bribe, no corruption, and the world is listening. When you embrace excellence, when you embrace integrity, and when you start creating jobs, be a job creator instead of a job seeker, and if you look around, you will find opportunities to do so, the politicians will take you seriously. And some of you, will literally be drafted. You will be dragged to come and run or take political position, not because you campaigned, but like Daniel in Babylon, by the sheer force of excellence and his integrity, he became an advisor, a ruler for not just the Babylonian empire, his kingdom, the next kingdom, even the next superpower, Medupesia. That is how you leverage your influence for politics. Perhaps I, 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 at this moment, let, let me pause as you think of your next question to ask. Let me bring one young man uh, who is also one of the co-sponsors of this event, CAM, uh, the, the director for CAM, Center for Outreach Mentorship and Empowerment. He's one young man, I quickly flash uh, on the screen what they are doing with farms, et cetera, et cetera, to share with us some of the things as a student, as a young person he did and how it is impacting the world. And so God's will, if you are there, I want you to speak to this issue because many young people are discouraged, they are disillusioned, they are angry, they think they cannot do anything. And I want you to tell us it can be done, it is happening. So God's will, I want you to, uh, to, to say a word. Yeah, good, good afternoon. Um... As a way of adding our voice to this uh, coalition that has been built across the continent, we are angry. Every young person is literally angry from the south to the east to the north. But as Dr. Pippin was presenting, one of the key things, my brothers and sisters, we need to understand is we need to take our destiny into our hands. 
That is not to say minus God and all the stuff. We know, but take destiny into the hand. I come from the village. My father could not sponsor me to go to university. My mother had no money to take me to the university. By the grace of God, I got some uh, philanthropist who wanted to aid me to go to the university. When I got to school, I quickly thought, if these persons sponsoring me are there, what do I do? I have a sister. Uh, my future is at stake. I need to take a bold decision. Took my school fees, invested into business. I'm talking about photocopy business. And I am bent on getting a financial freedom. At least my economic variables should be good. By the time I was leaving the university, we had 16 to 25 people who work around the little shop. A couple of my friends in that business with me are on this platform right now. It is in that light we believe. So with the transitioning, we saw business. It was successful. In my university days, we single-handedly with my team were the largest business entity on the entire university campus. Today, we are talking about job issue. We are talking about how difficult the system is. Talking and getting angry alone will not solve it. Somebody put their hands to the plow. Let's get something doing. If it is in education, you can do something if that is your passion. If it is in leadership, you can do something. If it is entertainment or the side, my brothers and sisters, it is in this life we at come Center for Outreach, Mentorship and Empowerment. We believe that we want to see an Africa as a vision where students, young professionals of high integrity, they excel in their studies and they, they, they create a change by putting up a career, leading their society to transform the society. We believe we can empower ourselves. So this platform created this, this afternoon on this AU day. Let us not think about them. The disruption is about us. We have tried it in school. We are trying it now. There are brighter stories, God, by God's grace, we are going to tell in the future. Let us disrupt the society. Look around the environment. Look around your community. We can cause a change. It can be a person, an entity, a community, a family at a time. It can be done. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you very much for this. And, um, um, we have Nedson. Nedson, can you ask your question? Ask your question. We are listening. Hello, Nexon. Please, can you ask your question? There's a hand from Kenya up. There's one opera. If you are, can you ask your question? Oh. Thank you so much. Um, hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please, we can hear you. Opere. Th thank, thank you, you very much, uh, no. Pastor, for... Okay, Nixon, go first, you. man. Thank you very much, Pastor, for your presentation. That was uh, very enlightening. And, of course, the example you gave of uh, uh, how we can describe, uh, you know, uh, the world, even minus government. Um, you know, a simple example of Estonia. Today, Estonia is a small country. Uh, in Europe, but uh, it is known as the digital country of the world, simply because young people through startup decided to disrupt the, to disrupt the country. And therefore the government could see that and did not ignore them. And today it stands out as one of the countries in the world that is digital, nothing is done on paper. So I agree with you, uh, Pastor, that when we as youth arise and uh, do what we do with excellence, people will start noticing and give us the space for us to grow. And not only to grow, but even to scale up as we, as we, as we, as we know it. So yes, it is, it is possible. 
And uh, to quote what the former president of America said, it is our time, and yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, yes, you. I see a hand. Thank you so much. Uh, this is Engineer Pere from Nairobi, Kenya. I want to register my appreciation, Dr. Pippin, and the organizers for this. I appreciate the fact that the solution is in our hands. And I appreciate the fact that there is need for connection and uh, people in networking in order to improve on our areas of strength. As an African proverb says that, you will always think that your mother is the best cook until you taste the food of another mother. By networking, we will, I'm sure we can achieve much. My question now is, um, is that um, what are the modalities or what are the things we should enhance, do much more to enhance um, networking across the regions, like now in East Africa, we, what are the things we need to do even as Africans across the continent to enhance our capacity much more, realizing, bearing in mind the logistics which are there, especially uh, be it denominational, be it in churches, be it in government, what are some of the uh, in, uh, insights we can use to enhance networking bearing in mind all those impediments in church administrations and governments and all that. Thank you. Okay, a good question. Um, there are definitely impediments. And in Africa with, you know, so many, some 5,000 different ethnic groups and tribes, you know, if, if we are not careful, even tribal uh, differences can cause a big problem political differences, political parties, et cetera, et cetera. But the truth of the matter is, God has created the internet to leverage these differences. Right now, as we speak, I am here in Accra, Ghana. You are somewhere in Kenya. Someone is in Lusaka. Others are in the States, diaspora. Everyone, we are able to network so that we can now begin to talk about issues. You don't have to fly, you don't have to do this. And uh, the issue of uh, denominational differences, religious differences on this platform, you see different religions, some are Christians, some are Muslims, some worship traditional African religion, some are witches, whatever your, your profession, it does not matter for the task ahead of us. What we are saying is our house is on fire. And we need to come together Ruben, to Madhuka, come up with solutions. Money yesterday. My suggestion to you hey, is this. I sent money to you. Mind Builders Africa, you have created a platform together with the other host organizations. Start hosting such events at least once every three months or two months. Let's start networking. In every country, there are progressive you know, uh, organizations, young people's group who who believe in excellence, who believe in integrity, who believe in service. Start looking for them, link up with them, then reach out your hand, form networks across the continent. Africa is now a big family. The purpose of the Africa continental free trade, where now visa requirements, et cetera, they are being waived, boundary differences are being slowly taken away. This is our finest moment. And young people, you are the people who are technology savvy. Use it. Instead of just going to WhatsApp and Facebook and Instagram and just using the time and wasting away, create your own platform and network amongst yourselves so that on every issue, you have a friend in Tanzania whom you know from your, your friendship group, and then you start addressing issues. Believe me, we can use the technology platform to begin solving problems. If you are into agriculture, I know for a fact 
that Kenya is far advanced in technology and using technology in agriculture. Why can't people in Nigeria, in Ghana, in South Africa, learn from our brothers and sisters over there? When it comes to music, I mean, start networking. So my brother, the, the burden of today's lecture is, look, notwithstanding the problems out there, if you have identified a problem, then you are smart enough to find the solution. And you are the answer. And so start the networking and watch how it will grow. I see okay. some hands also up. Um, we have Stephen now. Stephen, can you please ask your question? Okay, thank you very much, um, Madam and Doc, for the insightful message you have given us. I, I am very encouraged by what you have given us. I, I started to disrupt the theatre industry. <laughs> if I should borrow your words, um, because uh, that is in Ghana here. Um, the theatre industry is a big industry. If you go to the US and the UK, um, and even a small country like Singapore, um, they are doing so well in the theatre industry. But Ghana has, you know, the School of Performing Arts has been in Ghana for over, over 60 years, but we don't even have a group of theatre professionals in Ghana. So by the use of uh, you know, the internet, I have started something which is um, to arouse the interest in the theater profession in Ghana here to create jobs for the um, you know, theater graduates in the country because they graduate hundreds of them each year, but we are unable to find jobs in the theater industry because to start with, we don't even have one. So gradually, I, I have been pulling, uh, you know, professionals from various um, um, countries across the, um, you know, places across the country. I am currently working so closely with um, Uncle Ebo White on how we can um, create a professional body to start with, to develop our theater industry so that we can begin to make a meaningful, um, you know, life in the country as an industry. This is what I think Dr. Pipim is talking about this afternoon, where we identify problems and we begin to deal with the problems, not to talk about it, not to be angry about it, but to face it. And I, I, since I started it this year, I started it last year in September, we have had a series of online seminars and um, symposiums, getting professors and other people from University of Oxford um, University of British Columbia, outside the country, and here, professors and professionals we have here, to put ourselves together to shatter a course for the theater industry in Ghana. That is what um, I have started now, and it is really going well to the extent that we have had a series of meetings with the Boite. We are now trying to come together to form, um, you know, a professional theater association for the Ghanaian theater so that we can start with. I think this is what we need to all begin to do in our individual ways to get Africa on the right track and to make Africa work again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Paul. I'm very excited because what you are doing is consistent with the theme of the African Union this year, the arts, the culture, the heritage. And what I would add, you must infuse it is, you know, you must come up with programs, theater, movies, etc., that instill values, values of excellence, values of integrity, values of service, so that we, we don't just get this entertainment nonsense where people just sit down and do some ridiculous nonsense. You, you must use the creative arts to educate and build the kind of African we want. There used to be a time in our Ghanaian and many African cultures, we had story time where our grandfathers would sit us around the, uh, the, 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 the fire where would tell us stories. What has happened? We have lost it. 
We are watching a lot of television, foreign made television, and what we don't realize is the one who is telling the story is controlling us. There is no such thing as value free movies or theater. No, someone is selling something to you. You think BBC you know, would invest millions of dollars having BBC Voice of Africa? No, 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 no. They are selling a product. So now is the time for Africans like you to link up. Nigeria has gone way ahead in the movie industries. Yes, they will do better in instilling real values instead of this witchcraft and uh, uh, sex adultery, uh, uh, that kind of matter. No, we can start building people up. South Africa is doing wonders. So link up with them. The YouTube has disrupted the traditional movie establishment. You can start creating your own content. Put it on YouTube, you get a following. And then whatever we were limited by in the past, now because of computer technology, we can do much better. I'm glad you decided not to go into just good selling goods because when we think about entrepreneurship and business, we only think about goods or services, but now you are trying to help us with ideas by creating content, link up with others. And once you have eyes to see, you start seeing them everywhere. Just one quick comment. You know, there is one gentleman here in Ghana. He trained as an aeronautical engineer. His name is Woody Meyer. He has done this program, Africa to the World. Simply telling the stories of Africa, instead of letting foreigners tell our story, and it is receiving massive support and massive interest. Those are the kinds of jobs we can begin to create. And as we create this, you discover that it will spawn many other industries. But use it to build values, core values, excellence, integrity, service. Those are the things Africa needs because the Western world and the Eastern world have shaped us into the direction we ought to go. So thank you, Stephen, for what you are doing. I pray that uh, after this is over, I need to hear more about what you are doing behind the scene. Thank you so much for your questions. Unfortunately, this is all the time we have. Um, we'll be very glad if you can send your questions via our social media platforms such as Facebook, Instagram, or any other platform we have available. Let Dr. Pepem address them later. Thank you so much for joining. We can see you have so much questions to ask us, but we've run out of time, unfortunately. Well, Belinda, before you wrap up, I would say this uh, to all of them. Uh, okay, Doc. We, we need to thank Mind Builders Africa for hosting this event together with their partners. You need to check out their website. They are doing a phenomenal work, mindbuildersafrica.org. You can take some of the questions that will be coming and you can use it as the platform to hold future events. I believe we can hold conferences. We can network, we can do so many things without you know, the, the political power God has given us the ability, and I want to thank you for being a catalyst to develop this. I look forward to seeing what else you would be doing in the future. Those of you who couldn't ask your questions, this is just the beginning. The Africa we want is beginning, and it is beginning because you are part of the change. Thank you very much. Now I leave uh, Belinda and his team to, to say the thank last word. Thank so you so much, Doc. Thank you so much. I know I've learned a lot, and I'm sure everyone that joined has also learned so much. Um, I would like to say a little bit about Mind Builders. And I know once they check out our site, too, they would find out more about us. But basically, Mind Builders, we also offer mentorship programs as well as. Um, 
we source for funds for entrepreneurial entrepreneurial um, young people who are coming up. You can check our websites as Doc has already stated. And if you have more questions as to whatever endeavor it is that you'd want to venture into, do contact us and we'll be more than willing to help you. Thank you so much, Doc, for this. I've really, really enjoyed my time with you. And I'm praying that we can do this more often, maybe not once in three months, maybe more than that. Thank you so much for joining us. And for those of you who are believers, let us pray that the Lord will watch over each one of us and help us to give him our very best. We wish you the best and God's blessings. Goodbye. The land is good. The land is fine. Gold we have. Diamonds we mine. Yet we find.